Well, I was going to gig Pastor Charlie. I was going to say that he's actually not out playing golf this morning. Um, it's unusual for me to be in the pulpit two weeks out of three, but uh, he is preparing uh, to marry Craig and Ashley this evening. So keep them in your presence as the two come together to become one flesh in covenant marriage. See, we see marriage differently from a Christian perspective. We don't see it as a contract. Our culture sees marriage as a contract, and contracts are easily broken. We see marriage as covenant. And covenant is not broken. So keep them in your prayers. I also want to introduce uh, two friends of ours. I, I would start to say old friends, but the, you know my, my friend Rudy might get upset with me if I say that. We've known Rudy and Lori Klaus for 25 years. And they have been missionaries in Africa longer than that. Um, they started out in the Congo and were there many, many years and, and uh, were driven out when, when war came to that land. And they relocated in Senegal, West Africa, a Muslim nation. They are with Wycliffe Bible Translators. They do good work. Rudy and Lori, would you stand up? <laughs> we welcome you this morning. Glad to have you with us. So we're continuing our series following the resurrection of Jesus, the ascension of Jesus, the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. So we, we are in a series that says, he is here, the Holy Spirit is here, now what? The question this morning is, what can the Lord do with one life that's fully committed to him? and that is willing to allow him to do everything in that person, that man or that woman, that he desires to do to bring about the real purpose of their life. The church's history is full of men and women who, when they were transformed in the power of the Holy Spirit, did great things, starting with the apostles. By the way, these were not either giants of education or even in their three years with Jesus were they giants of faith, but filled with the Holy Spirit, they began to turn the world upside down, men like Peter and John. And coming after them, following in their footsteps, were the early church fathers like Irenaeus and Polycarp. And following on them were the great reformers like John Calvin and Martin Luther. And following in their footsteps were the great movement leaders like John Wesley and even in more modern times of Billy Graham, or the great servants of God like Mother Teresa, or William and Catherine Booth who founded the Salvation Army. All of these people, great lives because of the coming of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus calls a person into his service and they are filled with the Holy Spirit and led by the Holy Spirit, there literally is no limit to what can be accomplished. Two weeks ago, as I preached, we looked at the persecuted church and we discovered that when the head, Jesus, when the head suffers, the body also can expect to suffer. And so it has been for two millennia. The head did suffer, and the body suffered. But persecution was not a problem in stopping the church. Satan may have thought it would. He may have thought putting pressure on the church would end its movement, but it didn't end the movement. In fact, the blood of the martyrs became the seed of the church, and the church has always grown under persecution. The greatest threat to the church's growth is really what we've begun to experience here in the West, and especially in America. We've become too comfortable with the world, and we've become too complacent with the mission that we've been given. What was our mission? In Matthew 28, Jesus says, go into all the world and make disciples, make disciples of all the nations. You don't have to go around the world like Rudy and Lori did. It can start right here, right in your neighborhoods, in the places where God has sent you to work, 
in the places where you recreate with your friends, your family, your co-workers, your children, your grandchildren. Go and make disciples. The Spirit calls us to repent. Repent of being too comfortable. Repent of being too complacent. And in his power, he calls us to engage in our real purpose. We often wonder, what is God's plan for our lives? And we want to know the details. Where am I going to live? Where am I going to work? Who am I going to marry? How many children will I have? Etc., etc. But God's real purpose for our life is not any of those things. Trust me, when we follow him, he'll take care of all those details. They're not unimportant to him. But it's not the focus of the real purpose that he has for our lives. Today we're going to look at a young man named Saul. And we're going to look at what a transformed life can achieve. Two weeks ago we saw Saul was a willing participant in the stoning of Stephen, the first martyr of the church of Jesus Christ. He stood there and approved. And after that he became a leader in the movement to stop what he felt was a false movement of these followers of Jesus. He began putting them in prison. His whole drive was to end this movement. But something happened, and it completely changed the direction of Saul's life. So let's take a look at Saul's story and see what brought about this radical change and what does it say to us about our lives today? Saul was well-educated. He was a student of the leading rabbi, the leading teacher of his day, Gamaliel. He knew Hebrew scripture dead on. Lots of information. And he was a Pharisee. What's that mean? Well, we might think of uh, Pharisees as a religious party in Israel. The, the Pharisees primarily believed that there was a resurrection of the dead and life after death. Now, they were not the only religious party. There were other religious parties. One of them were the Sadducees. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead and eternal life. That's why they were very sad, you see. <laughs> let, let that catch a little bit. Saul believed that this cult of Jesus' followers was destroying Judaism, and, he, and they needed to be eliminated. Saul aggressively attacked the church in Jerusalem, and he quickly became known as an enemy of the followers of the way. That's what they called themselves. They weren't called Christians yet. They called themselves followers of the way. Why? Because Jesus had said, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. And so in identifying themselves, they said, we are followers of the way. And Saul was out to destroy them. So Saul then went to the high priest, and he requested and received permission to extend his attack on the church by going to Damascus in Samaria and bringing back any prisoners that were followers of the way. How did they get to Damascus? After Stephen's stoning, there was a great persecution of the church in Jerusalem, and the church was scattered out into Judea and Samaria, and Damascus is the capital of the province of Samaria. And so some of the followers of Jesus wind up there in Damascus. And what do they begin doing? They begin sharing Jesus. And people begin coming to Jesus by faith. And so the church is now growing in Samaria. And Paul's, Saul is aware of that, and he goes after them with a vengeance. Listen to what Acts 9.1 says. Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. His intent was that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. But on his way to Damascus, Saul had an encounter 
that totally changed the trajectory of his life. His life was going in this direction. And after this encounter, it went in that direction. Our story continues. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Knocked to the ground, Saul responded, Who are you, Lord? The word translated Lord here in the Greek is kurios. It comes from a root word that means one who is supreme in authority. Saul clearly recognizes that whoever it was that was speaking to him is one who had great power and really great authority. The Lord responded, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. It's very interesting to me, Saul is busy persecuting the followers of Jesus, and yet when Jesus encounters him, he doesn't say, I am Jesus and you are persecuting my followers. Twice he says to him in two sentences, Saul, I am Jesus, I am the one that you are persecuting. Jesus is not saying that what he suffered for our atonement wasn't sufficient. Far from that. What he suffered, his persecution, was all that was necessary to bring us into relationship with God again. But what he was saying was that by persecuting the followers of Jesus, he was also persecuting Jesus himself. Two weeks ago, we looked at the fact that we can expect persecution as the followers of Jesus. If the head was persecuted, the body will also be persecuted. But here we see the other side of this coin. When the, when the followers, when the, when the body of Christ is under persecution, Jesus himself is experiencing the persecution. He, he is not far removed from what is going on with his people. He's very present by the presence of the Holy Spirit with his people. And so as he experiences persecution, we know our Lord is near. Our sufferings for him sake or his sake are near and dear to Jesus. He is with us through the person of the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus tells Saul, go to Damascus where he would receive his marching orders, his real purpose in life. The encounter with Jesus left Saul blind and he had to be guided into Damascus. So here he is blind for at least three days and he's not eating, he's not drinking, and he is praying. Listen, he is praying to a God that he had not known personally. He's praying to a God that he knew a lot about. He had a lot of information about God, but he didn't know this God. His whole world now has been turned upside down. Then the Lord appeared to a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. Our story continues. And the Lord told Ananias, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. For he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Ananias replied, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. Ananias was more than a little bit disturbed by the Lord's request. The church had been hiding from Saul, trying to avoid being thrown into prison. 
But the Lord says to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name to the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Jesus makes it clear to Ananias, Ananias, this is not a negotiable. I'm not asking you, would you like to go? Is it okay for you to go? I'm telling you, go. Saul was a murderous person. But because Jesus was changing Saul's life, and Saul was his chosen instrument to take the gospel to the Gentiles, Ananias is told by his master to go. The word translated instrument here is an interesting one. It literally means equipment, his chosen equipment. But in context, it's also used to refer to a wife contributing to the usefulness of her husband. Isn't that an interesting comparison? Ladies, You are a chosen instrument. You are chosen to be an encourager, a builder-upper of your husband. That's what that word instrument means. Saul would be useful to Jesus, a useful instrument in taking the gospel to the Gentiles. So Ananias, perhaps a little fearfully, but faithfully, goes. He goes to the house where Saul was, and placing his hands on Saul, he says, Brother Saul. Now that's pretty amazing. Here's a man who has been doing as much harm to the church as he possibly can, and the first words out of Ananias' mouth are, Brother Saul. The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me to you that you might see again and listen very carefully, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. That's water baptism. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. When Saul had his physical vision... He did not have eyes to see who Jesus was or what this movement was all about. But when his vision was taken away in the spirit, he now had eyes to see. And his life has changed. Jesus gives him back his sight. He's filled with the Holy Spirit, and he is now empowered for the real purpose that God has for him. In the comfort of the Holy Spirit, he experienced the presence of Jesus. Saul was a changed person. He is also a driven person. And in the past, he's been driven by his flesh to try to do the work of God. And now, he is empowered and directed by the Holy Spirit to actually do the work of God. Our story continues, Barnabas, another follower of Jesus, took Saul, took him, and brought him to the apostles. Imagine how the apostles felt. They knew who Saul was. They knew he was hunting them. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. There was no more unlikely apostle than Saul of Tarsus. But he was the chosen one of Jesus himself to go and make his name known among the Gentiles. Saul started preaching the gospel immediately, but he was not prepared yet fully for ministry. 
And the Holy Spirit takes him out, it says, into the wilderness. Actually, it's the desert where he spent up to three years being discipled and taught by the Holy Spirit. He was not ready yet to minister to the people of God, but after spending time deeply with the Holy Spirit, when he comes back to the church in Antioch, Paul is now ready to minister to the people of God. Saul started preaching immediately. In Galatians, he tells us his story about being taught by the Spirit. Then in Acts 9.31, it tells us, Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. Do you remember when Pastor Charlie was preaching some weeks back about the Holy Spirit coming on the apostles in Jerusalem? And there were 3,000 added to the number that day, that Pentecost day. There was a period of peace that followed as the church grew and numbers increased. And then came persecution. By the way, the persecution was also a tool that the Holy Spirit was using. He drove out the disciples to begin to fulfill their real purpose in taking the gospel out. And now the Holy Spirit is also bringing a time of peace once again so that this new young church in Samaria would also grow and prosper. It was strengthened, it says, and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. The Holy Spirit was guiding both the process and the progress of the church of Jesus Christ, bringing what it needed when it needed it. The Holy Spirit, dear ones, is normative for our lives as followers of Jesus. It is what we should expect to happen in our lives. The Holy Spirit was predicted back in the Old Testament. In, in Jeremiah, the, the only place in the Old Testament that talks about the word new covenant, it says, I'm going to change your mind and I'm going to change your heart. And in a parallel uh, scripture in Ezekiel, the Lord says, I'm going to Take out your heart of stone, and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh, and I'm going to place my spirit within you. The Holy Spirit is normative for the followers of Jesus. He's the presence of Jesus in the world today. And his power and his direction is just as available to us today as it was to his followers two millennia ago. Saul became known as Paul to the Gentiles. Some say he took on a new name. I think it's probably more likely that he had two names. He had a Jewish name, Saul, and he had a Roman name, Paul, Paulus. Paul means little fellow. Paul was probably not a big man. Saul means desire. It's interesting that he uses the name Paul now. It's both practical in communicating in a Gentile world, which is where he is going to be planting churches, as well as a profession of his humility, the little fellow who was the once proud Pharisee. Paul becomes a leader in the church at Antioch. And the Holy Spirit had the elders set Paul and Barnabas aside for missionary work. This was the first of three missionary journeys that Paul would take. And he planted churches and he discipled followers in Crete and in Galatia and Cappadocia. That's what we would call present-day Turkey. And he desired to go to Europe. And eventually the Spirit freed him to do that. And he planted churches in Thrace and Macedonia and Greece. Greece was the cultural heart of the Roman Empire. Paul's ministry led countless people to Jesus within his lifetime. And he mentored the next generation of church leaders coming behind him. He wrote 13 of the 27 New Testament books. Books that bless us 2,000 years later. 
His life was radically transformed and was used by the Holy Spirit to accomplish the spread of the gospel to those of us that weren't Jews. We're Gentiles, but now brought into the family of God. So what can we conclude from the life of Paul? First, he was a driven man. Those of you familiar with the disc profile, he was a D, maybe the highest D I know of. He was driven to do whatever he was doing, and he did it with every ounce of strength and energy that he had. Second, Paul was a legal, Saul was a legalist. What do I mean by that? In the Gospel of John, John says Jesus came full of grace and truth, and in Jesus, the two are married beautifully together. All too often, however, in the church, they have not been beautifully married together. Truth without grace is legalism. Some of us come out of churches that were very legalistic, full of truth, but no grace. That was Saul. He had lots of information about God, but he didn't have any change in his heart to know the grace of God. The other side of that coin is lots of grace without truth. We see that in America a lot today in the churches. Lots of love talked about, but very little truth proclaimed. And the culture becomes the greater influencer in these churches. That's called license in Christ, in the power of the Spirit. We are also called to marry grace and truth together. Saul was a religious man. He knew the law. He wanted to obey it with everything that was in him. And here's the interesting part. This zealous, religious Jew found himself in conflict with God. Understand, religion, whatever man's trying to do to be acceptable in God's sight, will find itself in opposition to the God of the universe. Second, called and called by Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit, this formal legalist becomes a messenger of love and grace. He takes the love and grace of Jesus Christ to people that had never heard of God before. Third, his relationship with Jesus through the presence of the Holy Spirit continued to grow throughout his life. It was dynamic. This was not a one-time event in Saul's life. For the rest of his life, he was constantly growing in the love and grace of Christ himself as he led others and discipled them. Fourth, the Holy Spirit takes the drive and energy that Saul had apart from God and puts it to work for God. He doesn't change some of that internal nature, that personality, that temperament of Saul. He takes it and he molds it and he turns it into a useful instrument for the gospel. Fifth, Saul experienced extreme suffering and persecution for the very name of Jesus. And he rejoiced, this is his testimony, he rejoiced that he was able to share in the fellowship of the sufferings of his master. Paul's a model of what one life fully committed to Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, can accomplish. What about transformed lives today? The Holy Spirit is still the power and the presence of Jesus for his church today. There is no power for any of us to fulfill our real purpose apart from the Holy Spirit. But the Spirit is more than enough if we are willing to cooperate with him. 
as we yield ourselves to the Spirit, this is what He will do. He will direct our lives. He will make our lives fruitful. And He will keep our lives from being unfruitful. In Galatians 5, Paul says this, You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, and that's often what happens inside congregations, isn't it? We get into it with one another. If you keep doing that, he says, you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. In verse 25, he adds this, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep step with the Spirit. So how do we do that? First, I believe we do it by yielding ourselves to the Spirit. What does that mean? By surrendering. Didn't we sing that this morning? By surrendering. By submitting ourselves to the Holy Spirit. Second, by seeking the Spirit in His Word. You see, all Scripture is inspired by God. It was the Holy Spirit that inspired the authors of every one of the books of what we call the Bible to write what God intended for them to write for our benefit. Seeking the Spirit in His Word, He uses His Word because He is one of the co-authors of the Word. Seeking Him in His Word, in deeper meditation, not just reading the Word, but meditating it. David says, I meditate on your Word day and night. I allow it to go deeper inside me. Holy Spirit has the power to take the word that he wrote and transform us with it. And we seek him in prayer. Third, learning to discern the Spirit's voice. Many years ago now, my first year at Oklahoma State was the last year that Coach Hank Iba coached our basketball team. Henry Iba was a giant in the, in the basketball arena. He had a gravelly voice. The arena could be filled with yelling people, and you could hear Mr. Iba's voice above everyone. Believe me, his players discerned his voice. We are called to spend time with the Holy Spirit on a regular, let me encourage you, daily basis so that we learn to discern his voice. There are many voices clamoring around us and we have to learn to discern the voice of the Spirit. Paul wanted to go to Europe early in his ministry and the Spirit said, no, the time's not right yet. He knew the voice of the Spirit. He discerned it. Fourth, acting on the Spirit's directions. When the Spirit finally told Paul, go, he was off like a bullet. All he needed was the word, you are now free to go, and he went. You remember Jesus when he's talking to the Roman centurion, a man under authority, He said, my servant's sick. I want you to heal him. Jesus says, okay, well, I'll go to your house. He says, no, you don't need to go to my house. All you need to do is speak the word. He says, I'm a man under authority. I get that. When I say go, people go. And when I say stay, they stay. I understand authority, and you have it, and all you have to do is say the word, and it will happen. Acting, acting on his directions. And finally, depending on his power. 
You will receive power, Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Martyrs in the Greek, from which we get our word martyr. depending on his power to live out what he calls us to do, our real purpose in life. I want to spend a few minutes with you on a discipleship paradigm. What's a paradigm? It's a model. Call this model, no be, do. One of the things that got pounded into us at seminary, but I like it. It is a complete model of what a follower of Jesus' life is to look like. The first component is the know. Here is where we learn about Jesus. The Holy Spirit is actively engaged in that process with us. As we begin to know about him, it's head-oriented. It's information. But we have to have it. It's the starting point. But we don't end there. We move to B. What is the B? The B is experiencing the Lord. We experience him in the power of the Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit comes to reside in us because we have received Christ for forgiveness of our sins as our Savior, we are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this B component is not a head component. It's a heart component. You see, Jeremiah said for the Lord, I am going to give you a new mind and a new heart, and you will know me. And that's what this relationship with Jesus Christ is all about. It becomes about knowing him at an intimate level, not simply knowing about him. Many of us have much more information than we live out. And the live out comes out of this heart-focused transformation of our lives, a transformation that is inside-out transforming. The culture would change us outside-in, but the Spirit of God is changing us inside-out. He's changing who we are so that we become His representatives in this world. And the last component is do. It's hands-focused. It is how we act and live out our lives. Head, heart, hands, all of us belong to Christ. Here is where our mission, our real purpose is lived out. Head, heart, hands. Bring up the next one, Steve. Before his conversion, Saul was a no-do kind of guy. He was a driven religious man. He had lots of information about God. And he was zealous in doing whatever work he thought needed to be done. He was driven in it. He would not be stopped. He was relying on his own power. That's the problem with this model. The no-do model relies on our old nature, our flesh, and it's weak. There is no spiritual work that can be done by our flesh. Move on to the next one, Steve. Saul lacked the B relationship with the Lord. Until he encountered Jesus on that day, that fateful day on the road to Damascus, and then was filled with the Spirit. From that point forward, Paul lived out his life, his due, out of his connection with Christ through the Holy Spirit. Lincoln, if you'll come up, please. It's the B that most of us struggle with. And it's the B that is critical in achieving our real purpose. Saul found out it's impossible 
to do work for God in that old nature, that old sinful nature. That's why he talks about it so much in his writings. He says, no, we have to do this in the Spirit. This work, this real purpose that God's called us to has to be guided and directed by the Spirit of God or it simply won't happen. So how do we know if we're living in the Spirit today? Some say speaking in tongues is the evidence of that. A prayer language. And I believe it's a good thing. It is a gift of God. It's lifted, listed in the gifts of the Spirit. But it is the only gift that is talked about that edifies us individually. Every other gift of the Spirit has been given to us to serve one another in love. They're to edify and build up the body of Christ. I believe the better evidence is the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says this, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Are we seeing this fruit in greater measure in our lives today? That's the question that each of us needs to ask. Are we seeing this fruit in our lives? If so, it is evidence of being filled with the Spirit, being empowered by the Spirit, being led by the Spirit. If not, we're living in our old nature, in that flesh, and we're trying to produce spiritual results from the flesh. Impossible. Spiritual results come through our yielding to the Holy Spirit as he empowers and directs our lives. I believe we are already here at Gateway beginning to experience a move of the Holy Spirit. Lives are being changed. I believe there's a greater move of the Spirit coming for us and the call is to be ready. Being filled with the Spirit is what God intends for the followers of Jesus. It is not something weird. It is the norm for us. Over time, church organization became institutional and it replaced the Spirit in many Christian traditions. In other traditions, the written word, the Bible, has replaced the Holy Spirit. I revere the Bible. We revere the Bible. We revere the Word of God. It is all from God by the Holy Spirit. But it is not all of the Holy Spirit. If it was all we needed, the Lord would not have promised that we are going to receive the Holy Spirit to come to live within us, to be with us forever, to give us power, to direct us, to guide us, to comfort us, to counsel us, to teach us, to minister through us. This was either ignorance of what God intends, or it's the human desire to be in control. Neither of these things, the institutional church, nor just the written word, can replace the spirit who Jesus sent to be the source of power and direction in our lives. Paul's life was transformed through an encounter with Jesus and being filled with the Holy Spirit. His life moved from no do in his flesh to no be do in the power of the Holy Spirit. And it reflected, his life reflected the fruit of the Spirit as he lived out his real purpose. As you reflect on your life today as a follower of Jesus, 
Are you seeing fruit of the Spirit in your life? Or have you been trying like Saul to live your life, out of, a, a spiritual life, out of your flesh? Would you like to experience the real purpose that Jesus has for your life in the power of the Holy Spirit? Charlie has been telling us, if God has more for us, why would we want less? Why would we want less if he has more? If that's you this morning, in a few minutes, we're going to pray. And we're going to pray that the Lord would draw us closer through his spirit, that he would empower us, that he would direct us to lead a fruitful life of real purpose. Changing our posture towards God is important in receiving more from God. It's another thing Charlie's been teaching us. To change how we respond to the message that God's giving us. In a few minutes as we pray, if you want more from God, if you want to experience more life in the Spirit, and move out from trying to live out a follower of Jesus' life in your old nature, I'm going to ask you to stand. A way of changing your posture. A way of responding to God that says, that's me. That's what I want in my life. I'm telling you, that's what I want in my life, and that's what I need in my life. Paul never stopped growing. His life was dynamic in its relationship with the Lord Jesus through the Holy Spirit. And so we're called into that same life today. If you're ready to receive more, then what I want you to do is just stand up this morning. Stand up and we're going to pray together. Don't be afraid. This is not something to fear. We're moving. We're moving to meet God right where he wants to meet us. Let's pray. Lord, we come today and we come expectantly. Lord, we come expectant of what you're doing, doing within this congregation and doing within our lives. And we want more of what you want for us. We don't want to try to live in the Spirit by trying harder in our flesh. We know that doesn't work, Lord. So we come to you today and we ask that you fill us to overflowing with your Holy Spirit, that you empower us, Lord, that you direct us by your Spirit so that we will live our life in the fruit of the Spirit and achieve the real purpose to which you've called each one of us, what you've already planned for us from eternity past. And in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray it, and the sons and daughters of God said together, Amen. If you'll all stand, keep Craig and Ashley in your prayers this day as they come together. And it's always the, one of the great privileges for me to give the benediction, the blessing of God. If it helps you, hold out your hands to receive it. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine on you and give you peace. And you're rising up and you're laying down and you're going out and in your coming in, both now and forevermore. Amen. You are dismissed.